everyone. My name is Jennifer Dill. I'm a faculty member in the School of Urban Studies and Planning, and along with my colleagues, Chris Monsier and Robert Bertini, uh, we uh, organize this weekly seminar. And today, um, I'm very happy to introduce uh, Joel Franklin, who's a PhD candidate up at the University of Washington, uh, uh, to present some of the research that he's been working on. And uh, I'm not going to say a whole lot, but more important, well, maybe not more importantly, but he's also a UC Davis uh, alum, as am I. So go Aggies, and I'll turn it over. <coughs> Um, so I, um, I, I got my undergraduate and master's degree at uh, uh, UC Davis and worked with uh, Debbie Niemeyer down there in the civil engineering program. Uh, and then I got out of that, worked for a consulting company for a while, uh, doing all sorts of transportation planning and engineering uh, consulting, and got into travel demand modeling, and then uh, got very interested in land use and transportation modeling from there. And so I decided to go back for an urban planning PhD program uh, up at UW uh, in Seattle. So that's where I am right now. But even though I got started on land use and transportation modeling, as I was there, I got more interested in equity issues. And as I've gone through shaping my, my dissertation, it's really become a focus on transportation and not so much on land use. Uh, so I'll be talking mainly about, um, about this, this idea of how do we do equity analysis and, and look at social justice aspects of transportation policies. Um, and the way I've phrased this is, um, is this is a perspective, but it's certainly a very narrow perspective on how you would, might do social justice um, analyses because I'm taking a very rational approach. I'm really looking at how do you compare distributions of welfare um, among different scenarios. And so we'll see how that comes about. Uh, so what I'm going to do today is I'll give you a problem setting, a very common one that you've probably heard about, uh, congestion pricing and roadway tolling. Um, I'll give you a conceptual framework for how I'm attacking this problem, uh, which includes a behavioral model of what, what uh, travelers are thinking or how, how their behavior can, can be constructed um, and how we analyze it. Um, and then I'll show you a case study for how, for how we might look at this, issue, this idea of, of roadway tolls and, and um, do a welfare analysis on it. So then I'll get actually into this welfare analysis and using the case study, how might we estimate individuals' welfare or well-being um, and then I'll talk about how do we analyze the distributions of people's welfares and how we can construct some hypothesis tests that then respond to what the problem really is. Um, then I'll make some comments at the end. Uh, now, what I'm really going to be talking about today is, is the method, it's really the methodological aspects of my research design. So I'm not going to be showing you any results, um, but I'll be, be talking about how this methodology that I'm working on um, response to what, what the questions are out there today. Um, so first of all, the problem setting. Um, this is, I'm going to start with some very basic ideas of how, of, of roadway economics, really. So here we have a chart of, of how, how some segment of high, highway would operate in terms of people's, uh, in terms of the flow rate, and then their, the individuals on that, that highway, what kind of a time cost they're having to expend. Um, so as the flow rate would go up, we see that travel time will increase. So their tra time cost is going up. Uh, this is from the perspective of an individual driver. Um, if we actually look at the marginal cost on the entire set of drivers on a roadway, though, this is something that, increase, that increases at a faster rate. Um, you may have heard already that in, in some of your transportation-related classes that um, that for every car, additional ro car in a roadway, it increases their, not only their own travel time, but the travel time for everybody else who's on that roadway. So that's reflected in the marginal cost curve. And as you see, at some point, that marginal cost curve is, is above the average cost curve for the driver, from the driver's perspective. Um, so now if we overlay a demand curve, so, so this is how much someone would like to drive given the travel, uh, the, the time cost. And as the travel time cost goes down, fewer people will actually want to be on that roadway. Uh, so what happens is when, the, um, when the, this demand curve crosses the, um, 
the individual cost curve, this is where the, the natural equilibrium will happen. The problem is the real cost that each driver is actually um, taxing on the system is above that. It's along this marginal cost curve here. So we have an inefficient system because of this, this dynamic. Uh, what economists have been saying for a very long time is that, that the solution to this problem is marginal cost pricing, where we toll drivers exactly the amount of, of this discrepancy between the marginal cost and the average cost. So what that would do is elevate the dark blue line up exactly that amount so that it, bring, it, it, it brings a convergence between the demand curve and the marginal cost curve and this, this additional toll on the um, on the, the personal cost. So now each driver is paying a personal cost that includes time and the toll that's exactly at the, equal to the, um, the uh, marginal cost at that demand point. The pro and, oh, and, and this area in here is, um, is the, ben the total benefit to society of doing that. Um, so there's a, there is a total economic efficiency gain from doing this sort of thing. This is fra fairly clear in literature. The problem is that there are some disagreements about what the sort of the, the more social implications are of a roadway tolling system. So this, these these prime arguments are that if you implement a toll system, lower income people are less flexible about when they can travel, about where they can travel to and from, and are are, are more restricted about having to pay that toll. Then, and so they're the ones that will be impacted. Um, moreover, low in, lower income people tend to have a higher marginal utility of money. So. A dollar is not a dollar to everybody. It's not the same to everybody. Different people have a diff get a different amount of value from it. And so people who have lower incomes to begin with value ev every additional dollar more than somebody who has a lot of money to begin with. So it's a larger burden to pay that toll. There are some counter arguments um, that, that haven't been, that haven't been uh, really convincingly shown in, in analyses, but, but the, the arguments are still there. And that is that um, that lower income people already predominantly use transit, and so they're able to avoid that toll. Uh, and not only that, because they're using transit, and because a lot of toll revenues tend to be used to help transit systems, they may actually benefit quite a bit from a tolling system. Um, but the, ma the main point is that this issue really isn't isn't resolved. Um, so, so I, I'm trying to take to add to this discussion a bit. Um, with, with my conceptual framework. So here, here what, we, what we're really trying to do in this rational approach toward looking at this question is ask, in what ways does a transportation policy like this change the distribution of welfare in a population? Um, so who are we really, we really concerned about? We have a collection of individuals, um, each of which has their own personal well-being, which can be thought of as consumer welfare, can be thought of as income, there are various ways various ways to, uh, to think about this, but ultimately there's some quantification of how well, what somebody's well-being is that we can make. Um, and then the question becomes, what distribution of individual levels of welfare in a population are more desirable than others? And what policies are associated with the more preferable distributions? Okay, now here, here's some, a whole range of things we might do to um, to attack this problem. So we need we, to have a unit of analysis and we need to know some things about those units of analysis. These are the people involved. Um, we need to have a beha behavioral model of what kinds of decisions they're making. We need to be able to model the congestion dynamics. And I, I showed you one model, but that was really not the only way you can model congestion on a, on a roadway. Uh, we need to know what policy to test. The refunds, we have to have some idea what, what's going to happen with the toll revenue. Um, and then we need to be able to measure the welfare of every individual and analyze the distributions of welfare. I'm not going to talk much about the literature. I'll just mention a few studies that are sort of representative. Uh, there's some work um, by Arnett, De Palma, and Lindsay that have, have are, it's unique because they're use, actually using a bottleneck style congestion model where instead of representing a highway as, as having a fixed relationship between travel time and flow rate, they've act, they, they conceive of a highway as having of a bottleneck where, where a queue develops when it's over capacity and then that queue dissipates. And so people, every individual can actually decide what time of day to travel. Um, that's really what makes their work unique. Um, Eliasson and Matson in Sweden have been doing some work uh, on the proposed congestion tolling system for Stockholm. Um, 
And their, their work has been uh, especially interesting because they, they're, they're really focusing um, seriously on this issue of how is the revenue used. And, that, and they've pointed out that the use of revenues is really important to, to discussing distributional questions because it may be very different if the revenues are spent in a lump sum or spent in some other way. Um, and then Ro and Such uh, have been doing some work in France. Um, and their work is also unique because they, they've been looking at a Hicks, some Hicksy and what measures of welfare. And I'll, I'll, I'll talk about more about what that is. Um, but some of the things that haven't that haven't been really been done. So here, here are sort of the, the important areas that you might be interested in from a distributional perspective. Um, so to begin with, if we're interested in, in, in welfare distributions and, and how we might consider whether a distribution is equitable, then we need to be able to reflect a variety of incomes at the, begin, at the beginning. We can't treat everybody as identical because their income is really an important question. Um, so that, that's why I've highlighted this over here. Um, and behaviorally, we also need to make sure we're accounting for um, the idea that people don't make the same decision in every circumstance. And so there's some probabilistic aspect of, of travel behavior. Um, with some of that work, we notice that there's, there's the bottlenecks are important um, because it, might, it may distribute uh, travel. To, uh, it may distribute when people actually travel among um, a whole spread of time instead of all in one instant. Um, and then the use of revenues is important. Um, and then uh, it's important also to use a Hicksian uh, welfare measure that incorporates income effects. And I'll tell you why that's important later. Um, but then finally, if we don't interpret the distribution in some way that responds to equity, then we're really not using all this useful information about distributions. Um, um, so I've, I've set up a set of, of testable research questions that I'm going to, to examine. Um, the idea being that I'm not trying to, to think of equity and distributional aspects in one particular way, but I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in operationalizing this equity question in ways that have already been reflected in a variety of policies. So would a policy polarize people's welfares? Would it spread welfares? Would it be regressive? Um, would it increase the number of people in poverty? Um, so, so I have, I've outlined eight different ones here, and I'll come back to some tests for those. Um, but first, I want to get into the behavioral model. Uh, so really, my behavioral model is rooted in random utility theory. Um, in random utility theory, we're conceiving of what, what kind of a process do people go through to make decisions, and how can we um, observe and predict um, decisions such as what what mode to take to work, what time to travel to, day, to, travel to work, uh, where to work, where to live. Um, so the way we would do that is we can observe people's actual decisions by taking surveys um, of whether people take a bus or, take, or, or drive, for example. Um, we can also observe their income. We can observe prices, and we can observe travel times. And from that, we can, we can say that we can observe some portion of the total utility they get this utility is, is, is really a construct, but it's something that's useful in, 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 in the idea that we're assuming that every individual is going to make the choice that optimizes their own level of utility. And they're going to act rationally, and they're going to act in, independently. So they're only, everybody is only trying to maximize their own utility level. But some portion of utility we always know is, is unobserved. Because as it happens, even if we know all, everything about income, prices, and travel times, and even if we can quantify observed utility, we're not always going to correctly uh, predict what choice they actually made. So we as analysts have to assume that there's some other portion of utility that we're not able to capture, and that factors into their total utility. Um, so by using, so this total utility then is just a sum, sum of the observed and the unobserved utility. Um, to operationalize this, because we can't observe the unobserved utility, we can make an assumption that it's distributed randomly. So here I, I assume that it's distributed in a Gumbel distribution. Um, and then I assume that, that the observed utility has some systematic function of income, prices, and travel time. Um, if we make those kinds of assumptions, then we can actually um, estimate parameters for the systematic function here. Um, so now we have a fully specified function of, of observed utility. And using that, 
if we now now if we change the incomes or prices or travel times or if any of the factors change, the problem is now we don't observe the actual choices they make anymore. So the choices are, are totally unknown. But given the the, uh, the systematic model that we've we've developed for for observed utility, we can estimate the probability of making each choice. Okay, um, and using those probabilities, we can simulate what choice they might make. Okay. So that that's really how I'm going about conceptualizing individual behavior. Uh, now I'm going to talk about how how that. I'll be, I'm using that in a real case study. Uh, that case study is, this, is in Seattle. Here we have um, the uh, 520 bridge across Lake Washington, which, uh, which connects downtown Seattle to the eastern suburbs, uh, where there's a lot of housing. There's also Redmond, Washington, where Microsoft is. So it's also a big employment center, and it has um, heavy commute volumes in both directions because of that. Um, there aren't really very good alternative routes. Um, I-90 is, is really the main alternative route. Um, and if you live to the north of here, you might go around the lake. Um, but it's really an isolated facility, mainly. Um, so I'm considering the AM peak hour journey to work for everybody that's on, living on the east side and working in downtown Seattle. Um, and the alternatives that I'm considering are just whether they would take a bus or, we, or they, whether they would take an auto. Um, now I'm conceptualizing this observable utility, which I mentioned earlier, as being a function of income minus cost and of time. And then we also have some estimated parameters in beta. Um, now I'm also going to point out that this systematic function here um, has second order cost effects. So not only does it have this idea of income minus cost, but also has income minus cost squared. Um, and then it also includes second order time, so it's time and time squared. And it has an interaction between them. Um, so, um, so in the, but the main thing to take, take from this, this equation here is that we have a very specific function for observable utility that comes from travel times and from, uh, from the cost considerations. Uh, now the scenarios I'm considering are two. Uh, we have the, the no toll scenario and the with toll scenario. And the only difference is that there's an additional $3 toll for autos when, uh, when we, we introduce this, uh, the toll system. Okay, um, another thing to point out is that on the bus, it's 30 minutes travel time no matter what the other conditions are. On an auto, it's 12 minutes across the bridge if there's no congestion. But as we saw earlier, if there is congestion, then that travel time will go up. So that travel time, the, the travel time for autos then is variable. And that's whether there's a toll or not. Okay, and then the last thing is that the tolls, when they are collected, need to be used in some way. And I'll be looking at four different, uh, uh, four different options for how that money might be used, where in one case, the money is all burned and um, nobody gets it. Um, that's useful for looking at the distributional impacts. Uh, second, the money is returned in equal amounts to every individual. Third, the money is used to subsidize transit, so transit fares would essentially go down. Um, and fourth, it's used as a tax reduction. Um, so incomes would, would elevate by the fixed percentage for everybody. Uh, congestion on the roadway then, like I said earlier, uh, congestion, we, we, we have the idea that speeds will be going down as volumes go up. Um, so for this, for now, I'm, I'm really just using um, Bureau of Public Roads uh, curves, which are, are very old curves for how, for how uh, um, a freeway might operate, and they're used in most travel demand models today. Uh, okay, and then the last last thing is that if you look at this framework now, so I have incomes and prices and travel times affecting observed utilities, and then we can predict probabilities of whether somebody would take bus or take transit, given their given what utility they would get from bus and what utility they would get from transit, and then we can simulate what choice they would end up making. Uh, but the problem with this is that uh, really, if you sim start to simulate what choices people make, some people are going to take auto. They're going to be paying a toll then, and that toll will be refunded back into people's incomes. So this idea here that incomes have affected your um, utilities now is affected by the choices that everybody is making in the end. 
So we have a problem of, of an endogenous variable where something inside the system is affecting cyclically throughout. Uh, <coughs> so um, another in a similar problem is that as people decide to take auto, then tra traffic volumes on the bridge will increase, and that will increase congestion, and that will affect travel times on the bridge. So we have, we have two different cyclical problems here um, where, where the decisions at the outcome stage are affecting the, uh, the precedence for the model. Um, so to handle this, um, I'm, I'm iterating the entire system so that, so that what we really do is we start out with incomes with no payment, no refund, and travel times with no congestion. And then we start to run the model and then update the incomes and update the travel times um, to include the new information about what people are deciding. Um, and then, then this is just repeated until, until everything stabilizes. Okay. Um, so that's how the case, this is how I'm operationalizing the case study. Um, but then, so we have a system that might predict what people do, but it's still unclear how, might, how would that be useful in doing a welfare analysis. Well, it's useful because if we know all these sort of things about, um, about what people would decide to do in various conditions, um, then we can estimate a, a welfare measure. Um, we're going to be focusing on uh, the equivalent variation. Um, and this is, a, this is a Hicksian welfare measure where what we're doing is we're saying that what um, if a proposed policy like this toll, if you if that were to benefit somebody, let's say you did not implement that toll system, what payment would it take then to bring them back to that same level of utility um, without the policy? Uh, so so this equation here really operationalizes this. So this is the EV is some is some payment that satisfies this relationship. So we have a, we have the utility here that somebody. Uh, which, Will, will get from a situation. Um, we know the prices, travel times, with the no, without tolls, and we know the with toll prices and travel times. Um, and what we're doing is we're saying, and then we also know the toll revenues um, from uh, as they're repaid back into somebody's budget. So we know all of these things in the in the two scenarios. Um, but what we'd like to do is find out what payment in addition to their, their income in the, in the beginning, would cause their utility without the toll to be the same as their utility with the toll. And then that payment can be seen as a proxy uh, for the policy and what its benefit is to a person. Okay, but the problem with this is that we don't observe um, the unobserved portion of utility. So we really, we, we, can't, we, we can't answer this directly because we don't have that information. Um, so we can make a couple of, of assumptions. Um, one, one thing we can do is assume that choice is constant. Uh, so we can assume that every individual, if they're taking bus now, then they're going to keep taking bus. Or if they're, they're taking the auto right now, then they're going to keep taking auto. If we do that, then, then we, we, we've essentially eliminated that unobserved component of utility. And we can just find the equivalent variation payment that would satisfy the systematic portion of utility. Okay, so, so now we know, we know um, let's see. We, so we've taken choices as given. Uh, we, we, can, we know the travel times and prices before. We know it after. We know the refund payment. And, and, oh, excuse me. Um, so, so we can estimate what, what this equivalent variation payment would be exactly. But that's a pretty strong restriction if we assume that nobody changes their decisions <laughs> afterward um, because it really disregards an entire group of people it's the people that, if you implement a toll, it, it, it brings them some hardship that's to the, point, to the degree that they've decided it's no longer viable for them to drive, and they, they're going to need to, to take the bus instead. Or in the converse, it might be that there's some people that are benefiting from the toll and that they didn't drive before, but now that the toll's been implemented, travel times have gone down, there's less congestion on it, and so they're going to switch from bus on... Um, and, 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 take, and take their auto now. So there are some people that are going to be priced out of one and priced into the other. And we've totally disregarded those people in, in doing it this way. Um, here's an alternate way to go about this. Um, we can actually include these people uh, if we make another kind of assumption. Um, so in this, in this, is a, this is the common log sum uh, formula for how to, how to evaluate um, 
equivalent variation or compensating variation from a policy. Um, here we have an estimate of, some, of somebody's expected utility with the toll. Um, and we have an estimate of their expected utility without the toll. So this is actually, without even knowing whether they're going to take bus or going to take um, auto, we can estimate what their expected utility is in a probabilistic sense. Okay, in both situations. So now we have a quantity of we, in utility units of what their benefit would be in each um, scenario. The problem is we need to convert that to some uh, into a money um, unit. And to do that, we need a, f um, a single estimate of marginal utility of money for everybody. Um, so that's, that's problematic because then we, we're assuming that everybody gets the same benefit out of a dollar, no matter what their income level is. Um, and that's been pointed out in the literature that that, that, is, that is especially problematic because if you do that, you're really going to end up understating the effects, positive or negative, on lower income individuals as opposed to higher income individuals. So whatever the result of your welfare analysis, it's going to be really focused more on high income individuals. Um, that said, this is very common in how economic um, welfare analysis is done for policies, um, in academic literature that is. Um, so, and the main reason is there just hasn't been a very good way to get around this. Uh, fortunately, in the past couple of years, a researcher in Stockholm has, um, has come up with a way to do this. Um, a uh, man named Anders Karlström. Um, so here we have an equivalent variation measure that's like the other one, actually like both of the other ones, except now we're allowing decisions to be dynamic and we can, make, we can, we can assume that um, the marginal utility of money is not the same for every individual. Okay, and uh, I won't go into too much detail into what's going on here, except to say that, that here, we, we, this first term here is the expected equivalent variation for somebody who always takes auto. Here we have the expected equivalent variation for somebody who always takes bus. Um, but then we have the priced out people. Um, people who are priced from auto to bus and people who are priced from bus to auto. Uh, for every individual, only one is going to be um, the case. So we, we see here that there are some if conditions. And so only one of these will really be in the equation for every individual. But this way we can account for every individual what, what their expected equivalent variation payment would be. Now, remember that equivalent variation then is our estimate of somebody's benefit from a policy between one scenario and another. So when we, when we do this using our two scenarios, we can, compute, we, we can compute this change in welfare. And then given that, and given their initial income, which is a, really a proxy for their initial welfare level, then we can come out with two estimates. Uh, we have their total welf welfare in the no toll, toll situation, um, which is really a vector here because we have a whole set of individuals. Uh, so it's a vector of welfare levels. And then we have the with, with toll situation, a vec another vector of welfare levels with the toll. Okay. Um, so now what do we do that with that information? Well, we have right now are two collections of welfare estimates, um, but it's, not, it's still not really very informative. Um, so I'm going to talk about a few distributional analysis tools that can help us look at this. Um, so um, to, some of these tools are depending on, on an analogy now. We have two collections of welfares, but we can treat these, these collections of welfare levels as random variables. So now I'm, I'm treating that as this capital W italicized, um, which is slightly different from the bold lowercase w, and that it's a random variable. Um, because it's a random variable now, we can actually represent that in terms of a cumulative distribution and a probability density function. Um, here I've shown you some fake data for um, the probability density functions in two different um, scenarios. So what we would see here is we have a whole range of welfare levels. Somebody could have zero wel welfare level. It's as bad as they can get, really. Um, or we have a few individuals that are at 150,000, whatever units this might be. But most people tend to be clustered in this area. So what this, this probability density function is telling us is where along the welfare range our population seems to be clustered. Um, and if you look at the two different distributions here, you see that uh, there's even there's a concentrated cluster with the no-toll situation, but the concentration of the cluster is a little bit less in the with-toll situation, and the tail is a little bit thicker in the with-toll situation. 
Okay. Um, but but now we, let's really start talking about how to quantify this in ways that are that are important to equity and regression, regressive policies, and and, and what, what can we really say about it? Um, something that's that's really common in literature is is to, to plot a Lorenz curve and then compute a Gini coefficient. Um, so in this case, what we do is we order all the people in the population in each situation. So we have a set of people under the no-toll situation. We know what their individual welfare level is. We can order them from lowest welfare to highest level. Um, and then we start, collect, start adding up the proportion of total population among those people. We plot that across the bottom. And the proportion of total welfare that everybody has across the top. So what we'll, we'll start out at 0, 0 then. And by the time we get to the end of the graph, it'll be at 1, 1, because we've included everybody in the population. We've included all the, the welfare. Um, but the slope is going to start out at a slow rate, because at that end, we've ordered the people who have the lowest welfare. And as it goes up, the slope is going to increase, uh, because that's where the people with the highest welfare are. Um, now, if everybody had exactly the same welfare level, um, then you would see this black dashed line in the middle here. Because every time you add a person, then you're adding the same amount of welfare to the total amount. So that is that's um, could be thought of as, as this idea of what would be a perfect society um, when it would be when everybody has exactly the same well-being, um, and then everything below that is something that's less than perfect. And the further down you get, the worse off it might be. Uh, in this situation, we see that. The, the solid blue line, which is with toll, seems to be lower than the dashed line, which is no toll. And that would seem to suggest that the no toll situation is, is um, more preferable in terms of equality. Um, that's, that may not always be the case, though. Sometimes the one line will actually cross another line. And so then it's not entirely clear which one is preferable. Um, so to be a little more clear about what might be more preferable, we can compute a Gini coefficient. So the Gini coefficient, the easiest way to think about it is it's the ratio between this area between the diagonal and the blue curve. That's the numerator. And then in the denominator, we have the total area beneath the diagonal. So it's just this triangular area. Uh, so then if you had a perfectly equal population, there would be no area between those curves. And it would be, so, so your Gini coefficient would be zero. So a perfect equality society would be a zero Gini and a society where all of the welfare was in one individual and everybody else had no welfare would be a one. Um, so anything between that tells you what, what it might be. Um, and then anything, any policy then that increases the Gini coefficient would be considered um, to be regressive in terms of its equity effects. And if it decreases the Gini, it would be progressive. OK. Um, the next thing I'm going to talk about is a relative distribution. And this is a totally different way of looking at the same data in terms of, of its uh, effect on the distributional impacts. So here, instead of looking at one summary measure of, what's, um, of, of whether something is regressive or, or progressive, now we're plot basically going to plot the ratio of the, PD of the probability density functions. Um, so before I showed you. Here we have two probability density functions. And they seem to be clustered in, in this area. But you see that the tail is thicker. Uh, I mean, I'm sorry, the peak is thicker for the no-toll situation. But the tail is thicker for the with-toll situation. And you see that reflected here in the ratio between them. Because when we take the with-toll and divide it by the no-toll situation, we see a value less than 1 in the lower range and greater than 1 in the higher range. So a way, a way to think about this is where is the density of population shifting when we go from the no-toll situation to the with-toll situation? So the, the density is shifting from these lower areas to the higher areas. OK, that's, now this, is, this will be useful marginally, but it's not very conclusive. Um, the nice thing is we can use this new construct in a few other measures. Um, so the first one being this callback liebler divergence. Um, this is an informational theoretic measure of, of, what, of what kind of information is contained in probability distribution. The reason this is useful for us is 
if we have two distributions and we know they might be different or they might not be different, this can quantify the qu this question, are they different or are they not, um, and give us a conclusive answer. Um, so if they're, if they're identical, then the, this, this KL measure will always be a zero. Uh, and if they're different in any way, whether it's an equity difference or, or if everybody's better off or everybody's worse off or, or everybody's better, more consolidated, any kind of a change will be reflected by a positive um, KL measure. That wouldn't be the case if we were to take, for example, the change in the mean, um, in the means between, between two different distributions. So, um, so this is useful in detecting any kind of a change. Um, and then the second one I want to mention is uh, med median relative polarization, where we are really just interested in whether the density of people is getting concentrated in, in terms of their welfare levels or is it getting dispersed in terms of their welfare levels. So are people, is, the easier way to think about this is are the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer or is it the other way around? Are the rich getting poorer and the poor getting richer? Um, so this can quantify that. Um, and then lastly, I'm going to map that to some hypothesis tests. Uh, so I mentioned eight of them earlier, so I'm, I'm going to go back through them in more detail now. So the first question that we might ask then is, does a policy make any kind of a difference? Uh, and the KL measure answers that question. So if the KL measure is zero, then we can say no, there is, there is no difference. Um, and we can actually just forget about the rest of it and go home. But the second question, if that other one doesn't pass, if it is different, then we, can, we move on to the rest. Uh, the second question then is, is the one that's most common in benefit cost analysis and in cost efficiency questions. And so the question really then is, oh, I'm sorry. I thought I heard a question. Um, uh, so then the question is, um, does this policy make an aggregate improvement in everybody's welfare levels or an aggregate de um, depreciation of their welfare levels? Um, so then we just sum their welfare levels across everybody and, com and compare them. The third question is, does the policy increase or decrease the number of people in poverty? Um, this is a very focused question, but it's one that's used more in, in, in social justice um, questions. And so it's useful to be able to operationalize this. Um, but it does require you to have some idea of what a poverty level would be. Uh, so I've identified this number here, W with a frown on top of it. Um, those are the people that are, uh, so that's some threshold, and then everybody that's underneath that welfare level could be considered in poverty. So if that's, if the number of people in poverty is the same between one scenario and the other, then we might say that the policy doesn't have any effect on the poverty level. That's pretty limiting in what it can say, though. So let's get into some more, more interesting things. Using the Gini coefficient, we can respond to this question of um, regressivity. Uh, so here we see the Gini coefficient computed for the with toll scenario and computed for the without toll scenario. And if they're the same, then we would say they, that it's not regressive, it's not progressive, it's, just, it's really a neutral policy. Um, fifth is the policy polarizing. Um, so this is distinct then from question four in a, in a minor way. Um, it, well, in that it, it really is going to isolate um, the effects of, on the aggregate uh, from the effects on the distribution. So I showed you before number two where we're looking at the aggreg aggregate effects. Um, well, that, that, the, the conclusion to that will affect the conclusion to the Gini coefficient, question number four. But it will have no bearing at all on whether question five um, turns out to be true or false. Um, so, so that's useful because it's totally orthogonal then. It's really just treating this idea of is, it, is the distribution consolidating or is, or is it polarizing? Um, and then number six, I'm looking at a group-based um, uh, equity analysis where I end up identify, say, five different groups based on percentile ranges and then compare their levels, their total welfare within each group. Um, so this is really, um, this is actually the most common way that, that literature looks at the equity question is just to look at income groups and compare the results. Um, and the, number seven, I'll be look, using the relative distribution again. This, uh, it's back to this curve here. Um, and then the question becomes, in what ranges do we see gains and losses? And the way that that differs from number six, so here we have a categorical view where we're looking at what ranges, what specific ranges gain or benefit. 
but it's really, it really requires you to define your ranges in advance. And it may be that by doing that, you're going to miss some interesting things or important things that are happening in the distribution. By using a graphical measure like this, though, we can actually let the data speak for itself and tell us what ranges are being affected positively or negatively. Um, and then last, the last question is more of a question of accessibility, uh, uh, excuse me, acceptability. Um, is, is the policy something that the populace would approve of? Um, so let's say you put, put a congestion pricing measure to a vote. Um, this is something that's actually going to happen in Stockholm after they do a one-year trial, is they're going to put it to a referendum. Um, so then the question you'd be interested in is, is every individual voter better off or worse off than they were before? Um, so, the, so the way you would quantify that is, is this what you, what you see here. So if the number of people um, that are worse off be than before versus the people that are better off or equal than before. We, here I'm sort of making the assumption that if you're equal, then you might be inclined to vote for it. Um, it's really, that may not be the case at all, but it's really just a, a mathematical convenient, convenience. Um, but, but by taking this kind of equality, we can, uh, if, if one of these is greater than the other, then we can make it, um, we can sort of make a guess at whether this referendum would succeed or fail. Um, so if, if more people were worse off before, then we would expect it to fail. This is totally disregarding how much worse off they are or how much better off they are. But it looks at for each individual, do they see it as a positive or negative thing? Okay. Um, so that's, that's really the, the whole thing. And, and I'm just going to say a few th things about how this then um, fits into some of that literature that I mentioned earlier. Uh, so here are the little squigglies that show what other studies I mentioned earlier. Um, my little squiggly then fits over here. It's simpler than the other studies in that I'm really just looking at individuals in terms of their income levels, where a lot, whereas a lot of other studies have categorize people in terms of where they live and um, what their family type might be, what their employment situation might be. Um, certainly that can be done in this framework, but I'm not doing that. Um, I'm also focusing only on mode choice whereas a lot of these other studies have, have looked at other dimensions, uh, especially other travel modeling dimensions. Um, but it would actually, it would be useful to look at some of these other uh, dimensions, especially because um, by what, what, what I can say is that because people's travel behavior is actually more complicated than just choosing auto or just choosing bus for a single trip, then it's probably true that anything you might change in their circumstances people will have ways to accommodate that a lot more than what I've represented. So if somebody, if you introduce a toll during the peak hour, they might not jump the bus. They might just travel earlier in the day or later in the day, and that might be better than taking the bus. So because I've neglected to account for that, I'm going to be overstating whatever welfare effects this has. Um, so that's just something to keep in mind. But, but in principle, the way that I've represented these decisions can still be accommodated. So. I, it would be perfectly reasonable then to expand what I'm doing here to include other choice dimensions. Um, so the things that I'm really adding to the literature uh, are using this uh, Carlstrom's Hicksian measure. So I mentioned the equivalent variation measure where we actually include income effects. So, um, so we don't treat everybody as having the same marginal utility of money. Um, and then I'm also treating a whole variety of different um, distributional interpretation measures instead of just focusing on, an, on a few. Um, and there's some, that of some of those measures really just haven't been used before. So, there, so it is a new application of those measures. Um, so, um, and then another thing about that, that this does then is by, by preserving information about people's incomes at the beginning um, and then by treating their choice as a random decision, um, and then including that information then in how we compute the welfare measure, and then in representing those distributions in the final welfare estimates and the conclusions, what we're really doing then is preserving distributional information. And so information that's in sort of the tails of the distribution all the way from the beginning to the end of the process. We don't lose any of that. Um, so some of the limitations, I actually already mentioned some of these. Um, so I'm not treating these other, other choice dimensions. I'm also not um, not using a bottleneck model. Um, this is a this is an interesting question because the model the, the, the literature on the bottleneck model bleh, bottleneck model is pretty strong, 
that a static model is flawed in how it looks at the, the way a roadway works. The problem is that when actually implementing a bottleneck model in any kind of, of useful analysis, it makes the process so much more complicated that it prevents you from doing a lot of doing interesting things with it, uh, just because of the computational time. Um, and so, even, even though there was one study that I mentioned earlier that does this, most studies don't aren't doing that, and I and I haven't found a way to incorporate that in my research yet. Um, the last thing I want to mention is I haven't talked at all about inference testing. So this is the question that. So I've come up with a bunch of measures of whether something is good or bad in various situations. And I actually have some information about, about whether I'm confident of what people's income levels are and whether I'm confident about those beta parameters that I estimated earlier for people's choice behavior are. But I haven't been able to carry that information forward into these conclusions about what the polarization level is and what the regressivity is. Um, but to do that, all I really need to do is to repeat this process using a random iteration process and then, and then simulate distributions of the final measures. Um, and, uh, and, then, and then using that, I, we can actually estimate confidence intervals. And then we can say we have a 95% confidence that it's regressive within this range or it's progressive within, within that range. Um, so we can actually make some, some more firm conclusions about it. OK. Um, that's, that's really all I, was, all I wanted to talk about. Um, I'd be happy to answer your questions. And I forgot to remind people to use the microphones in front of them and to hold the touch button with the red light on while they're asking their question. Mm -hmm. And um, since I'm talking, actually, I'll go ahead and ask. Okay. <laughs> I'm back when you were talking about your behavioral model. Yeah. And uh, you were talking about the endogenous and sort of the loops and, and how that's the, the outcomes need to be fed back in. Yeah. And one of the questions I have on the top part of this is that um, the toll revenues, assuming that they're going back to people somehow, yeah. factors into income. It seems like it depends on how it's factoring back and sort of the time yeah. dimension. So in other words, if everyone got just a refund, like in Oregon, we have this kicker rule that you know mm -hmm. if there's a state surplus, we get a check at the end of the year or the next year or whatever that's cash that gives us back some of that money. But if it was, uh, you know, somehow, let's say, I instead of that way of having the tolls coming back, it was reducing a sales tax, for example. So mm -hmm. it's every day that there's right. that may be affecting things. Have you well, seen much literature on that? I mean, if well, it it's it's an it's an important question. I mean, you can either you can choose really either to treat this refund check as affecting choice behavior or as not a cho not affecting choice behavior. And actually, I think. Either argument is fairly reasonable. Um, it would be simpler not to include it. Um, it would, or certainly, be easy, it would be slightly easier to not to not include it. And it would also be reasonable because of this time delay factor. And then also, you might say that that really it's such a small amount on people's budget that that it's just not going to have any effect on on whether on how what their well-being is and what their choice <laughs> behavior is. Um, the problem is that it, in in the the, the literature that argues for congestion pricing, one of the important aspects of that literature, or the, the argument, is that is the idea that if you did collect this toll revenue and you did return it to people, then there would be a total there would be a total benefit, and it would be reflected in, in this same way that I'm showing it here. Um, so it's crucial to that argument um, to show that there's a net benefit to congestion pr pricing. Um, and so, so I've decided to represent it. The other reason I've decided to represent it is in there is because even though there's an additional computational cost of going through the iteration, it's already necessary for me to go through this iteration process because of the congestion loop here. Um, so, so I've already decided I need to go through this process, and it's no, it's really no extra cost for me to to add to update incomes in the same way. Okay, and then also in terms of the time dimension, so you might say that there is a delay in the effect it has on people's behavior. So I. The supporting assumption that you would have to make then is that this toll system will stay in place for longer than a year, which is prob probably true. If you were to introduce a toll versus not, it's not something you would turn on or off every day. Okay. Yeah. I don't have a microphone, but uh, one of uh, one of the questions that you raise is the uh, the time saving, um, and you said that you're going to hold the, the 
the transit users is getting no time saving, but one of the things that we find, for example, with the London congestion pricing is that one of the biggest benefits has been more reliability and lower uh, delays for the, for the transit system. So are, you know, uh, why are you leaving that out of your analysis? Yeah, uh, so the question was, uh, in, case, in case it couldn't be heard on the microphone, is, is why, uh, why is it that I'm, ignoring, I'm treating transit times as fixed um, and, and, and I'm ignoring any possible benefit that transit would have from the toll system. Um, and the reason, it's sort of the way I'm conceiving of my model is, or, or, or the actual case is that I'm treating this 520 bridge where you have two lanes that are general purpose and a third lane that is transit only. Um, so operationalized, uh, operationally, that third lane would work independently of anything that's going on in the general purpose lanes. Um, and so it's not quite as, Im as important in this particular situation to include that. Um, there are probably some benefits that would, it, that would come to transit on either end of the system, though, if there are any other knock-on effects from having fewer, fewer, fewer vehicles going on enough ramps, fewer vehicles in the, the CBD um, affecting the transit system. So sir, there probably would be some effects. Um, the, really, the number one reason I haven't included it, besides this operational issue of the lane configuration, is that it's it's a simplifying assumption. It makes it easier for me to deal to to model the problem, and it's something that it's a reasonable comp, um, refinement that one can make. But it's just one of many possible refinements. Yeah. Um, as somebody new to planning, I just find want to say first off that I find it very nice that you've broken up down just microeconomics and how it actually applies to planning and some of the methodologies that we can use and actually apply it to planning, because I've never seen that before, so okay. thank you. Um, but my question is, I, I understand that you're really focusing on methodology for the presentation, but with your case studies, um, when you use the methods, can you just set a little bit more light as to what your results were? Uh, yeah, I think maybe the best way to do that is to mention some work, um, some work that I did in Stockholm. I'm going to say after I drink some water. Oh. Um, so in, uh, I spent six months in Stockholm on a fellowship to, uh, working with some data they had that was, they didn't use the economic measures that I've talked about here. They used a much simpler method uh, of taking the travel model outputs and computing a rough estimate of consumer welfare. So they still had a measure of individual well-being at every um, point in the process. Um, and, they all, and besides what I was doing, they also did a lot of work on equity questions themselves. And we both came to the same conclusions with that data, and that is the difference, the difference in welfare level across the board is very small compared to people's initial um, incomes. Um, but secondly, and so, so it's a scale thing. It's, just, it's such a small difference that it's hard to say that it's a really strong equity effect. Um, but, but it may be there. Um, the, the other problem is that it really strongly varies based on how you use the revenue. So they were looking at those same four scenarios that I mentioned before where the money is, well, actually three different scenarios. I, I added the one where we burn the money. Um, the second question, the second option was to distribute it equally. The third one um, was to use it for transit. And the fourth one to, was to reduce taxes. Uh, really, the results were just like you might expect. Um, if you give it to the lumps, give it back as a lump sum, it ends up being a progressive policy because people get the same amount whether they're high or low. And the people who are at the low end, get a better benefit out of it. Um, they, val they value that dollar more. Um, but if you use it for taxes, um, if you just use it, to, if you were say to, to spend that money back into the general fund, then it would have a benefit that's proportional pe to people's incomes. Um, so it would be regressive because the people who have the highest incomes will be ha would have the highest absolute tax rebate. Um, so there's a whole variety of things that can happen in the refund. And, and so that was really the main conclusion, is that there may be some distributional effects in the policy itself, but, but really the big difference is happening in the way you use the money. Okay. Um, what would happen if you used the earned money for transit, like for subsidizing transit? With, how would that affect your analysis? So I, I'm really just using very simple uh, um, way of operationalizing that. I'm just saying that it's, we're going to reduce the fare. So we have some amount of money that we collect from the tolls. Um, I'm just saying that we reduce the fares for all the people that take transit by some equal amount. Um, so it, it ends up 
benefiting everybody who, who decides to take transit in an equal way. And they all get an equal check. And then everybody who drives gets no benefit from the toll. Yeah. yeah. There were two questions that came in by email. Okay. And uh, just to remind everyone, I don't edit the questions. I just read them. So... Uh, <laughs> It says, the first one says, isn't the point of using tolls to force people to drive less and or take mass transit more often? If you subsidize tolls, what is the point of enacting a toll? Oh, if we were to subsidize tolls. Um, I, don't, I, I didn't intend to imply that in, here, in this situation we would be subsidizing tolls. Um, but I, th I think probably what this, this questioner is getting at is, is, there, is that there are reasons that you would want people to take transit instead of cars. Um, and those are some of the other externalities that I haven't even talked about. Uh, air quality benefits, energy dependence. Well, if we could quantify those things, then it would be perfectly reasonable to add that to the toll. And then that would fact, factor into to our overall analysis. And fewer people then would drive than before because it would be a bigger toll. Um, um, but but I, I, I guess... It could be done, but I'm not, I'm not really treating that question because it's a wider question and I'm, I have a narrow scope for what I'm doing. I'm wondering if, if the person is thinking um, by taking the money from the toll and giving it back to the people some way, then they're, they're not fully paying, you know, they're getting oh, some of it I back. See. So in other words, if you burn the money or if you, um, let's say you spent it on something you bought wetlands or, you know, you did something yeah. that truly did not come back to their income. Okay. Okay, yeah, I, I see. Um, this gets back then to, to your question in the beginning, or what I, what I was saying in, con in that context, in that I'm really responding to the argument, the primary economic argument for tolls. And within that argument for tolls, um, the idea that there's a net benefit to people depends on there being that refund check. Um, if there isn't a refund check, and I found this with the Stockholm data too, if the refund check isn't there and the money is burned, then there's an aggregate loss to everybody. Um, and so, so that's the reason not to do it. Um, I feel like you have a follow-up question to this. because you, It's not really a follow-up. I'm just, I, I've uh, read some places that um, in, in, re in the terms of redistributing welfare that it also helps low-income people who who still drive, let's say, can't take the bus because, for example, if they have child care, lower-income people are probably more apt to have child care, and if, if they can use it, if the toll lanes, it's possible for them to get back to their daycare sooner, and uh, often what will happen is that the congestion price per minute saved is lower than the price per minute of extra right, daycare. Right, right. This is, for. yeah, this is sort of the, the the, this, the counter argument against Lexus lanes. Uh, when, when the toll lanes in Southern California were introduced, they thought that it would, it would be all high income people, but in fact, um, a lot of people using it are people who value that particular time, minute in that particular time of the day a lot more than somebody in the Lexus because they're the ones that are going to lose that money that you, you mentioned if they're late picking up their child from, from childcare. Um, yes, so in certain situations, that people do value that more. Um, and that's that's why it's 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 a little bit limiting to think that every that low income people are always taking transit. That's just not the case in the United States. It may be more true in in European cities, and it is very much in Stockholm. But um, but we can't make that assumption here that lower income people are are able to take transit in all situations. Okay. Um, oh, you had a second question from the email. There's another uh, email yeah. question. Um, you can do it the way you what you want. It's kind of a local question, so you may not okay. know the details. I certainly don't. I've heard that there are pl tentative plans to reintroduce Portland's old streetcar system, but the residents living in the West Hills complain about it because they believe it would lower the value of their property. Can you address this possibility, myth or truth, through socioeconomic and social justice perspectives? Oh, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. This. Uh, the question was sent in before your talk. So oh, was it really? So maybe it was from a previous talk. <laughs> a late question. Um, or someone on your committee, maybe. Oh, great. Um, that sounds like Paul, actually. Um, um, well, th yeah, this, some of the, I, I would say that, that some of the ideas that I've talked about here about ways to look at economic impacts of a policy could be used 
to test that kind of a question, you would really need to be looking at property values and how, how the housing market works uh, so that you could include um, well, you need to be, you would need to include more than just property values, in fact, because you really need to be able to understand what every individual person values in a location. Um, and, uh, whereas property value modeling in itself really just looks at market values. Um, so I'm going to say it could be done. It would take a much more complex modeling, behavioral modeling framework that I, than what I presented here to do it. Um, but that question should be able to be addressed. Yeah. First questioner confirmed that Jennifer was right about her question. So. Oh, good. <laughs> Thank you, Jennifer. Any additional questions? Um, I guess first, it's nice to see uh, the application of, uh, of a simulation modeling technique to questions of, of equity mm -hmm. and congestion pricing. Uh, my question is about uh, you had you you displayed this probability distribution. Uh, function for for welfare, I, I think it was. Uh, yeah. Remember, this is all fake data, so don't read too much into it. Okay. And I, I was just wondering okay. how you and you said that this you were going to treat this as a random distribution. Yes. And I was just wondering how did you determine, or how would you determine what the what the exact distribution function would be? Is that an output of the model mm -hmm. or something that um, you actually? That's something I didn't talk about. Um, I would be using. Basically, weighted kernel density estimators to to estimate a smooth function. So it would end up being a non-parametric smooth curve, just like this, based on the actual data that were observed. Um, and I don't have anything to show you right now about what kernel density estimator is. If you, we can talk about that afterward, maybe if you're curious. Uh, but it's basically just a systematic way of guessing what the probability density is at a particular point on this scale. Um, when we only know on certain individual points what people's actually well, actual welfare levels are. Okay. Yeah. Um, so regarding your eight, the eight questions that you use to yeah. evaluate um, the success of a process, um, I guess the second question there, does the policy make an aggregate improvement? I wasn't clear on... What exactly that means in the context of the questions that follow, as, okay. as if those almost answered that question in some way. Well, in a, by an aggregate improvement, I'm really talking about uh, a fairly narrow idea of does the total welfare level for a population increase or decrease based on the policy. So this is ignoring any of the distributional questions of who gets a benefit, who get, doesn't get a benefit. Okay. So it ignores what there, there's no information in that equation there about what their income level is or what a good income level might be or how it's, how it's distributed. So, so it's, in fact, yeah, in fact, if you were to look at the details of this, you would see that in the other situations, income gets factored in in that welfare estimate. But here, because we're subtracting the welfare level bef uh, afterward to the welfare level af beforehand, their initial income drops out of the equation. So it becomes something that's totally uh, ignorant to what people's income levels are. Uh, as to a couple of assumptions, so uh, as you get the toll implemented, uh, would there be no change in like travel speed? Like, would they have to stop to pay the toll, or would they be automatically yeah. go right through? It's it's reasonable to think there, that would be the case in a real system. I totally ignored that in this way I set this up. Um, you might think of it as an electronic toll system, where everybody just flows right through. And also. Uh, with the kickback, the money that comes back to them, how is the the value of that money handled? I mean, is it does it mean the same thing to them as the three dollars they pay at the toll when it comes back to them, or is there is there some sort of does that mean when it comes back in the form of like a you know a decrease in their taxes, it may not register to them? Right, right. Um, I'm treating it as this, the, the same dollar for dollar for for a given person. Um, the only difference is among between one person with one income level and another person with a different income level. Um, but for an individual person, I'm treating them the same. Yeah, yeah I think you were... Um, one of the things I guess I was thinking about when you're talking about um, the tolls going back to the public, Yeah. I mean, one of the things that's been pursued in Oregon is public-private partnerships. Mm -hmm. And so my question is sort of, 
that assumes that the money is in all public hands. And so what do you do with the private element of the partnerships? Yeah. The money, and how does that factor into equitable distribution and that sort of thing? Uh, I haven't addressed this notion of what is equitable about having it being private ha in private hands. I haven't addressed that at all. What I have done in my the framework that I've written written up, but not what I've shown you here, is that I've allowed for there to be some pot of money from the toll revenues that that disappears into presumably into con construction or maintenance maintenance of the system. Um, but that is the same money that it would end up in the private hands. Um, so it's it, it, the way this would be operationalized then. Not all of the money would actually go back to, to to into people's hands. Some of it would disappear. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, behind behind you. Yeah. Yeah. In the hat. Um, yeah. Would would methods like these commonly be used um, to convert a, a normal road into a toll road? Is that is that kind of a common process and kind of for taking of taking a lane that's currently free and putting a toll on that. Yeah. You could do that. Um, in a sense, that's what, what would happen in, in this case because it's a free bridge right now. It, it's, it's two lanes in each direction. And when it's rebuilt, it will probably be two lanes in each direction plus a bus lane in each direction, actually a carpool lane in each direction um, with, with buses. Um, so it's slightly different from what I'm talking about. But it's still replacing existing free lanes. So, so it is that situation, sort of. Um, but it, it could be an additional lane. I mean, it's, it's flexible. You could apply the same principles, absolutely, to a change in, in lane configuration. Yeah. You can, uh, in fact, really the way the way I, it's the way the uh, utility function is specified ooh, way back um, is that any any set of of prices. You have prices here and here and here, and you have incomes here and here and here, and you have travel times here and here and here. And so any th if you can evaluate what those three things are using whatever model you have for the roadway, then you can do this. You know? Yeah? Um, how do you find people in poverty? How do you identify? Well, I haven't identified them except to say that, that it's just some threshold level of, well, of, of income level. Um, and so I'm, I'm not really familiar with poverty-related literature. I've included this because it is a, it's a common approach. Um, but I have very little detail as to how, what a poverty level, level would be, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Has there been any estimation to the rise of uh, oil price? Here? No, no, nothing. I'm treating oil price as fixed, essentially, because I've treated the, uh, the, the base cost of the auto in both scenarios as, as the same. Um, so, so I haven't really accounted for an increase happening. Yeah, but it could be. Done. Yeah, it could certainly could be done. Yeah, but for what I'm looking at, I would actually rather keep them the same, so that I can treat that question, so that, so that I can treat my question separately from this issue of, of gas prices going up. Yeah. Yeah. And presumably, gas prices go up for everyone. Yeah, for everyone. Yeah. We. Yeah, I, uh, do, you, do you have differentials at, across the state line here um, in gas prices at all? I'm wondering if that's it's the same. It's not too big. Okay. We have full serve gas in right. Oregon. Right. So, so it uh, might be a little bit more. Yeah, right. though I don't know what the differential in gas tax is yeah. between the two states. So you might have, I could see a situation then where you might have that be an issue if you, were, if you had people living from different places. Um, and buying gas in different places then, and, yeah. Any additional questions? Okay, well, I want to thank you very much. I do have, if people are interested, a couple copies of uh, Joel's paper that he's going to be presenting at a conference on this in a couple weeks. Uh, before we thank him, I want to uh, let everyone know that next week we're going to have Fred Hansen, the general manager of TriMet here, talking about making transit sustainable. So I invite everyone to uh, show up or watch on the web again. And thank you very much, Joel. Thank you all.